concert pianist Philip Folk made his BBC Proms debut in 1979 and since then has played all around the world to great acclaim. He has a huge and varied repertoire and I'm so pleased he's joining me here today at Steinway Hall in London for a classical conversation. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining me. And I'm great just, pleasure. I'm going to start by asking you all about your musical education, how old you were when you started, um, what was the catalyst? Do you come from a musical family? Uh, well, no, I don't come from a musical family particularly, but my parents were always very supportive. But um, it all began really with my sister Alison, uh, my older sister, and she was learning the piano. And I remember so vividly, Melanie, the day that the upright piano was delivered to the house. And I was a boy of about four years old. And it came into the house, and I can see it vividly in my mind's eye. And no sooner had it been unwrapped and all the rest of it, but then I sat down at the, uh, at the chair and started making up tunes. So it's, I was about four mm -hmm. when it began. And which teachers then do you think were crucial on your development? Oh, I could get on my soapbox about this one. Teachers. <laughs> um, he said in parenthesis. But anyway, I hope there are no teachers out there listening to me. Um, but anyway, no, seriously, I was very fortunate to go to a school called Milford. And it was run by this lovely lady called Miss France, Ursula France. And the school had probably been running since the 1930s, you know, lovely, lovely place. And she was um, really quite an able pianist herself. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated watching her play the hymns and various sort of dance classes, because we were into musical movement in the 1950s, yes. all good stuff. <laughs> and um, she invited me to play Joy Milk Break. And Milk being break. the intrinsic show-off that I try so hard not to be, um, I sat down and made up tunes and uh, harmonised things and, and uh, she took, gave me my first lessons and very good ones they were too. Mm. So I remember those well. In other words, Mary, she allowed me to just do the stuff, muck around at the keyboard in front of people instead of this tyranny which so many people have of mm. primers and middle C and fingers of one, two, three, four, and, you know, the middle of the, the, the gravitational pull of middle C, I think, has caused more trouble than the yes. of this A. It is quite bizarre, mm. that, isn't yeah. it? Why middle C? Why is it not A? Anyway, we'll get to that. How did you develop your technique then, as you, as you well, uh, developed? Well, what happened after Miss France, she, she got me to a particular point um, and felt that I needed perhaps a little bit more strict guidance. And so she passed me on to a wonderful, a wonderful musician called Marjorie Withers. And Marjorie um, lived in Jazz Cross, where, where I did, my family did. And she was an extraordinarily gifted pianist and a gifted teacher of children. Right. And I was just so lucky. But she was immensely inventive about ways of practicing, about exercises, scales, strengthening fingers, you know, the, mm. the, the, all that kind of stuff. But um, she presented it in such a way and gave me those pieces that I liked um, that built up those kind of things. But she was very much into finger independence and all that. So when I was six, seven, you know, I was really into that kind of thing and loved it. You enjoyed doing that? I loved it. I just made up my own exercises and it's gone on from there. Right. I've always, always enjoyed doing that. And I'm not giving you a moment to ask me any questions. I'm it's terrible. It's superb. I do apologise. <laughs> but anyway, Please don't. Well, no, no. But the, and I, I'm a great believer, having performed a lot and, and mm. taught also a great deal, that I feel there's not enough emphasis put on just mucking about. Improvisation. Yes, improvisation. And you say, how does one develop technique? I mean, what is technique? It's, it's so many things. It's not just the ability to put down the right notes. It's the ability to make the, sound, the sounds and the balance and the voice mm. and, and articulation, even yes. all these things. And also, it's not just a question of the fingers, it's the arms, the eyes, the, leg, it's the whole body. Um, and I had a fascination in those days with, well, I loved syncopation. It's the 1950s and people like Billy Mayer were still playing yes. on, on the radio. The good old light program, Castle Radio 2. Um, and my idol, well, idols were Winifred Atwell and Russ Conway. That's interesting. And I used to imitate them. And 
listen to their records very, very, very closely and reproduce them. And of course, I was giving myself, unbeknownst to me, a tremendous oral training. Mm, yes. Um, and, you know, I think I was very fortunate. And meantime, Marjorie Withers was putting me through exams and um, I was doing, you know, Beethoven, I was doing Krieg, I remember. Um, you know, standard repertoire. Yes. You participated in quite a lot of competitions. Do you think that Well, you from... say that. No. <laughs> well, um, if I give that impression, or I, I don't want to sort of dispel it, but, um, I mean, we jump ahead and I went to the Royal Academy and so with the great and wonderful Gordon Green. Mm, yes. Um, and he had a very ambivalent view to, to competitions, which I think, in a sense, we all rather absorbed, but I I was never happy in, in the competition mm. arena, but I was also in an unfortunate situation where people saw my playing as very much competition kind of playing, and so I was in a very unhappy place really because I felt an obligation to do it, and yes. whilst not enjoying them at all, and so I only had limited success really mm. in the few competitions I did. Yes. Um, no, that's not me playing. Um, <laughs> um, for example, I did do um, leads twice. Right. I got into the second round, second time round. Um, and I did Tchaikovsky and got into the third round. Uh, but the one I did succeed in was the first Sydney Pan competition when I was in the finals. Mm. I didn't win, but I had the great experience of being in the finals and yes. playing Rack Pan of third in the Sydney Opera House. And that must have helped your career a little bit, or did well, you feel it didn't really? No, I don't think it did. Okay. And my, my great sadness, and it's nice to be able to voice it here, if anybody's listening out there, I have never been back to Australia since. Really? No, I've just well, that's a pity, happened. isn't it? And I would so dearly have loved to have gone, mm. um, and still would like to, but, but uh, it hasn't happened. So no, it didn't, didn't help me at all. Do you have a particular practice regime? Well, I did, and I always remember, and this is a wonderful moment, a sweet moment when I can drop names, but Ashkenazi said to me <laughs> that um, if you have to, if anybody needs to practice more than four hours, they're in the wrong business. Yes. yes I've heard and I think there's a tremendous amount of truth in that, a lot of truth in that. I think today, in the competitive arena where you can have it, uh, it's... Yeah, youngsters, you know, practice frantically, feverishly, addictively. Mm, mm. Um, and it, it has its place, we all do. You know, it's all very well me saying, uh, 40 years on, you know. But I, I, was, I, I was a very methodical worker, and I did work hard, and especially when you're learning your repertoire mm. at short notice, and yes. you just perforce have to do it. But I think it's become too much now, and I think there are too many what I call microwaved performances. Yes. <laughs> and I'm sure everybody knows what I mean by microwave performance. I've done them myself. Um, but they're not, you know, the, the repertoire, the piece is just not cooked through. It's, it's hot, it's fine, it's presentable, it tastes all right. But it's not, you know, it really mm. hasn't, hasn't bedded in. It's, it's, uh, and you have to record and perform on that basis. And I think it's a tremendous strain. And I'm sure, yeah. Melanie, it accounts to some degree why so many young people these days are running into yes. physical problems which were far less common when I was there. Really. Right. Um, and I think this has a direct bearing. You know, I love to say that music, when I hear a student playing to me, I always say, please don't play at me. You know, play to me. Yeah. And so often it's this feeling of it being sort of, I feel I'm already mugged. <laughs> and and you know, music exists in silence. It can't exist unless there's silence. And one wants to hear the silence in the music, and mm -hmm. there's no time for that these days. Everybody's Pushing. in such a rush. You play a lot of unusual repertoire, a lot of premieres. Well, like, do you really specifically love doing this, or is, well, it, is it an interest? A, a lot of premieres. I'm just trying to think what they are. It's, it's flattering if you'd say that. I don't think it's a lot of premieres, but I have done some first recordings of pieces. Um, a lot of unusual. Uh, a certain oh. unusual repertoire. Um, yes, but again, you know, Melanie, it was, especially with starting out, and I think for youngsters today, 
you're going to have a peg, you know, if you're doing yes. that, you, you'll get the date or the BBC will take you up or whatever. Um, and it looks good to be commissioning new music. And, and mm. I did, I never commissioned a piece, I was too scared of what might be presented. Um, <laughs> but what I, do you mean? <laughs> I don't know where this is going to be cut, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, I, I did premiere a, a fine piece by John McCabe, The Highly Variations, which he wrote for me, and that, and that, was, that was great. But um, I don't know that I've been entirely comfortable in that arena. I think I'm rather more traditionally grounded. Mm. Um, what I love doing in teaching is uh, working at contemporary scores, uh, no matter how abstruse they may be or complex. The one thing I will not do, and I will absolutely not do, is anything to do with prepared piano or fiddling around the strings or hitting pretty screwed. That is an mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, and I know it would be controversial if this goes out, but I think a piano is a piano. And, I mean, if you want to invent another instrument, by all means, but in this way. Yes. How did you become interested in the piano music of Sir Arthur Bliss? Because you've done. Um Several recordings well, on the piano concerto. Yes. Oh, well that's, that's quite a story, Melanie. Uh, we have to go back to 1973. Um, and there was a wonderful, a wonderful musician, teacher, pianist, composer called Ruth Gibbs. And she died oh, possibly 20 years ago. But she ran a, a marvellous orchestra called the London Repertoire Orchestra. And the London Chanticleer Orchestra, and they were sort of rehearsal orchestras. They also did dates and all that. Um, and she was a great fan of the Bliss Piano Concerto. And I just won the National Federation's was the Music Society's Award. That's the one thing I did win. And I'd also done quite well in the uh, BBC Piano Competition, as was before it transmogrified into the Young Musician of the Year. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and um, so I was sort of quite a young up and coming pianist, and she got hold of me and said, Philip, I want you to do the Bliss Piano Concerto. And of course I said, well, yeah, I'll, I'll do it, went out and bought the music, as one did. <laughs> yes. Not having even heard the damn thing, I shouldn't say that, that's a beautiful thing. It is. Um, Quite but, a shock though. Oh, it was a tremendous shock, so it was a big date, it was at the Fairfield Hall, yeah. uh, with the London Repertoire Orchestra, it's a professional group, um, and I only had, oh, that was the beginning of really, that, that became a habit. I suppose, four months to learn it. And of course, I wasn't used to that kind of learning in those days. Mm -hmm. um, and I can remember Melanie having a real panic about a, a month or six months, um, six weeks before, saying to, phoning up Ruth uh, and, and saying, she was known as Wid, saying, I, I'll do this, but I, I want to use the music, I just can't, it's just not it. And she said, pooh, pooh, of course you can do it, and put the phone down. And it was probably the best thing she could do. I couldn't, you know. No. I just <laughs> had to do it. Had to do it. <laughs> had to do it. <laughs> and, you know, occasionally you need that kind of treatment. Mm. So she gave me a smack on the wrist, which was, which was good. Uh, and I did it, and then it became quite, quite a piece. Mm, mm, yes, because it's written some great, yeah, great yeah. pieces. And sadly, um, I just missed Arthur himself because I went to the house in um, Warburg Place, St John's Wood, to run it, uh, to play it ostensibly, but he, he, he was he very did. ill and he actually did just die just before I could do it. So, mm -hmm. but dear um, Trudy, his, his widow then, came to the concert and he'd only died about two weeks before. Oh gosh, that's a shame. So that was, and we became good friends. Yes. That. She was very supportive. Yeah, she, you recorded a lot of his... his I did a lot of his... Or probably all his piano music. Not all his piano music. music. No. Not all his piano music, but, but a fair amount of it. And um, that was a few years ago for Chandos. Mm. Um, and I hoped that a few more things would happen, but yeah, life is still going, so it might yet. Yes. Which venues have you loved playing in? What's now, your favourite? Uh, well, now that's, of course, one, it's difficult. I mean, the Wigmore Hall has such associations. Yes. And it's, it's such an instrument in its own right. It's, it's warm, and I just love those cinema tip-up seats. I feel in its refurbishment it's lost a little bit of the old style. Mm. It had a certain sort of sort of shabby glamour and it's lost that. 
even the two gas lights that used to be either side of the stage, you know, they, they went, you know, little things like that. But um, it's a beautiful acoustic. I'm afraid to say the Festival Hall, um, it's like playing in a huge aircraft hangar. But the hall I like in London, which of course people don't necessarily like architecturally, is the um, Barbican Hall. Mm. I find that actually a pleasant place. And the dear old Fairfield Hall is a lovely, yes. lovely yes. hall to play. Yeah. What exciting plans have you got for the future? Not much. Um, I, I'm not one of these people with great plans and projects because, you know, I had this very um, pressured and quite high profile performing career up to the age of well, my middle 40s. And throughout the time leading up to that, I always enjoyed teaching very much. Yes. Um, and really backed off performing. But my, my last prom was the Warsaw Concerto, but that was a few years ago now, and that was televised. But no, I haven't, I haven't got... The thing is, Melanie, and this is perhaps a, a, an opportunity on, on, on this medium, I find that the whole business of music making, performing, and specifically the piano, but, but in general, has become so sort of packaged and so promoted. And, yes. and, and, and I, I just find that we've lost, you know, I like, I mean, just to sit down and play. Just, mm. You know, if I feel in the mood, I just sit down and play. Um, and what I feel like without having a theme to it, in Scotland you've got to do all this or all that, or this. And the other thing I absolutely live in dread of are anniversaries. Oh yes. You know, all these things, why can't one just play? And the reason you can't play what you want when you want is because it's also competitive. Mm, you know, you've, you've got to plan, you've got to have an angle and all that. I want the angle to be me, rather, rather sort of selfishly. It's anybody <laughs> out there, it's me. If you want me to play, you know, email me and I'll come and play. Uh, what I fancy, it, yeah. then. Yes. <laughs> yes. What does playing the piano mean to you? That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a toughie. What does it mean to me? Ah, you, you floored me on that one. <laughs> um, I think Slightly not answering the question, but I am meaning to answer the question. For me, performing was always something that it seemed that I was good at and that I was encouraged to do, and I was always labelled as a showman, even my reviews, to, you know, and all that. And I know that I have got that in a way, but that's part of it. You know, it's like the iceberg, you see what's above the water, but what's below the water is, is even greater mm. and perhaps more significant. Um, and I've had a rather ambivalent attitude towards performing over the years. I find um, the thing about performing, which a lot of people, and I include myself, can find quite hard, is the balance between doing something which is so intensely private in public. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I have found problematic at various times in my life. Um, you're on the stage and it's you're showing something immensely private. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so what's the piano mean to me? It's it's very rare that I would go to a band and sit down for a real pleasure. I mean, it's so rare. I mean, I've just recently got rid of my parents. Really? Yeah, I mean, actually, That's amazing. Sure. But um, <laughs> having had, and I was known for my beautiful pianos, my well-known studio in London. Yes, yes. But I'm, I find that, uh, and I've had my pianos, beautiful ones, for, for 30, 40 years, including the Mazevich piano. Sure. Um, all of that, and it's been wonderful. But I found, and when I went to concerts, that the pianos weren't a patch on my own. No. And now <laughs> I find that I just, I'm happy to play anything. And I don't have to compare it to my own, nor do I have to tune it, regulate it, turn it, voice it, heat it, light it, or anything. You know? <laughs> I just play other people's pianos, free, you know. <laughs> um, and I've got this place. You know, to, to come of with. course. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of quite happy like that. Um, but I, I don't know whether I've quite answered your question, what does it mean to me? 
I think in my teaching, I have always wanted to make it clear to my students that they don't have to do it, whilst encouraging them as well, I hope. Yeah. But I think that there, we live in a climate today when if a child shows what is perceived as talent and sometimes is overinflated, it um, doesn't mean to say you've got to be a professional no. musician. And I think that the future of music making, and I certainly um, support this, and I do a lot of work with, for example, adult amateurs. But I think the word amateur has become rather pejorative. It means less than good. I think it, it means no such thing. I've mm. come across amateurs who are immensely yes, and absolutely. more gifted than people who are struggling professionally. Yeah, sure. But they just didn't go down that way. Um, and I think that, you know, um, music making in people's homes, on the upright piano, you know, that kind of thing. You've lost that spontaneity. Definitely. Mm. And I think that is a grievous loss. And I think modern technology is wonderful. You know, it bamboozles me half the time. But it is marvellous. I can see all of that. But when I see an iPod or you know, all these iPhones, I think of the wind-up record, which I still have, <laughs> turning the, the thing, and all the hissing and all the rest of it. And nothing is lost. And a great deal is gained, you know, Melanie, because I've kept my machine. And occasionally when I... Um, play some of my collection to, you know, students, young musicians in their 20s, even later. They are so amazed by the quality of sound, for one thing, mm. but the sense of performance, yes. because these recordings weren't taped, it was just one take. You could do seven yeah, takes, yeah. but it was still one take. Okay. You know, so there, there are a few blemishes and fluffs. The reality of performance. Mm. And part of performing is to share your vulnerability. Nowadays, people don't want to know about vulnerability. No. You've got to be rock solid. It's got to be glitteringly perfect. And I think with that, you lose that sense of warmth and humanness. If something does get a little bit, not as you would wish. I think it's become a little bit contrived. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure.